stellar classification basically makes no sense. And it's not my fault. And I'm very, very sorry anyway, even though it's not my fault. I did not design this system. I did not create the system. I was not a part of this classification for the different kinds of stars because all this happened a hundred years ago. And it's just, but, but it's stuck. It's stuck. So, so what people were doing in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, is they were taking spectra of stars. They were observing individual stars and they were seeing lines on their spectrum of either absorption or emission. And they were discovering that these particular stars had uh, different combinations of elements in their atmospheres. And they were trying to classify these stars based on those spectra because that was the only thing they had. Uh, they they had distances to these stars, a bunch of them, but not all of them. Uh, they they had their brightnesses. They you can also get like a vague color, like some stars are bluer, sometimes some stars are redder. But there are some weak stars, feeble stars, small stars that are red, and there are some large stars that are red. There are a bunch of white stars of all sorts of sizes. There's a bunch of weird blue ones. The red ones are bigger than blue. It's like it made no sense. So they focused on the spectra. Early astronomers focused on the spectra of these stars. And the simplest, or, or sorry, the, the first classification schemes would just uh, try to separate stars into various categories. And they just gave them like categories with letters like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. So like that's an A-type star, that's a B-type star, that's a C-type star, etc., cetera, et cetera. These classification schemes made no sense as in like, cause they were just getting the data in. They weren't really understanding what they were doing. There were a bunch of overlaps and duplicates and like, oh, it turns out a B star is really the exact same thing as a K star. So we really should be the same category. Uh, who The person who brought a lot of sense into this was an astronomer named Annie Jump Cannon. She worked at the Harvard College Observatory and she looked at this classification scheme and said, okay, we need a serious rethink. We need something simple and straightforward, something that makes sense, uh, something that, that just helps makes this like not so messy. So she focused on a particular part of the spectrum, not the entire spectrum, but just a part of the spectrum having to do with the emission of hydrogen, or sorry, the absorption of hydrogen, and then used that to classify stars. And then when she decided that, when she made that decision, like, you know what, let's just, we're just going to focus on hydrogen and its behavior in these different kinds of stars, knowing nothing else about the relationship between hydrogen and stars that would come later, but just focused on what is the hydrogen doing. She was able to come up with a very simple classification scheme. And where she was able to combine a bunch of letters, uh, get rid of a bunch of categories, uh, and but she also had to rearrange some of the categories to make sense in her classification scheme, basically based on how strong hydrogen is acting in a star, if I'm going to put it very loosely. And she came up with a system that goes like this. There are O stars, B stars, A stars, F stars, G stars, K stars, and M stars. If you're wondering why that is uh, like seemingly random letters, it's because she was working on an already existing system and just reconfiguring it based on her new insight. As the years went by, Annie Jump Cannon was able to classify uh, 350,000 stars in her lifetime. Wow. She was like a machine for classifying stars. She, she was able to like just build these demographics of like, these are all the M stars. These are all the K stars. These are all the F stars. These are, these are all the O stars. And then based on that, astronomers were able to realize some connections. Remember, Annie Jump Cannon just made that classification just based on what hydrogen was doing without understanding anything else about how stars work because no one understood how stars work at the time. And we eventually realized that Annie Jump Cannon had found something very, very important, that her classification scheme wasn't just handy and simple and easy to use. 
it actually told us something about the physics of the star. We found that her classification seemed connected to the temperature of the star, the surface temperature of the star. We found that that connected to the mass of the star. We, we, we just connect. We found that there are all these connections. We found that her classification scheme tells us like where a star is and its life cycle. Like it turned out to be fantastic. It turned out to be way more powerful of a class classification scheme than anyone, even Annie Jump Cannon, had realized. And so this classification scheme from O on one side to M on the other runs the gamut of every kind of star. I'm, I'm going to tell you what we know now about these classification schemes. And yes, astronomers have refined this classification scheme, but I'm not going to get into that because for the most part, this is all we need to understand. Now, for a star that is in the, the middle of its life, so I'm not talking about when a star is forming or when a star is about to die. That's That's the next video of what happens to stars then. Uh, the classification scheme tells you many, many things about the star. For example, an O-type star <clears throat> in, the, in the main part of its life, an O-type star has a surface temperature of over 30,000 Kelvin. It will appear blue or bluish white to our eyes. It is very big. It is greater than 16 times the mass of the sun and has a radius uh, greater than six times that of the sun. These are the big stars, the, the biggest stars that our universe manufactures in their the prime of their life. This is what they look like. They are a very, very, very small fraction. They're around 0.0003% of all the stars in the galaxy. Very, very rare, but definitely big. These are the biggest stars. And the next category down are the B-type stars. The B-type stars have a temperature between 10,000 and 30,000 Kelvin. They'll look bluish, not as blue as those O-type giants, but still pretty blue. They can range in mass anywhere between 2 and 16 solar masses. They'll be around 1.8 up to 6.6 .6 times the radius of the sun. And they're around 0.1% of the population. The next category down is A-type. These are 7,500 to 10,000 degree stars. Mostly white. If, if that's too vague for you, too bad. It's just mostly white. These are all 1.4 to 2.1 solar masses, 1.4 to 1.8 solar radii, and around 0.6 of the population. Then you come down to F-type. These are 6,000 to 7,500. These pretty much look white on the spectrum. Like if you just look at them, they, they appear white. They're uh, just above solar mass to around one in uh, four, like 40% more massive than the sun a little bit larger than the sun, around 3% of the stars. You can see the smaller the, ma the mass of star you're getting, the more popular it is. Of course, it's much easier to make small things than it is to make big things. Then you get down to the G-type star. This is a sun-like star. Our sun is a G-type star. These are 5,200 to 6,000 Kelvin. They look yellowish white. They're around the size and mass of the sun, and around 8% of all stars in the Milky Way galaxy are G-type. Uh, smaller than that, you get down to the K-type. These are 3,700 to 5,200 Kelvin. These look pale yellowish, maybe even orangish. Uh, these are around half the mass of the sun to about 80% of the mass of the sun a little bit smaller in radius. You'll notice something here with stars, even though the mass shrinks, the radius doesn't shrink all that much just because that's how stars work. And uh, this is 12% of the stars. The vast majority of stars in our Milky Way galaxy are called M-type. These are the smallest mass, uh, as low as a tenth the mass of the sun, up to about half the mass of the sun. But they're less than like 70% the radius of the sun, so not all that much smaller than the sun. They have a temperature between 2400 and 3700 Kelvin. They look light orange to red, depending on the exact temperature of the star, and they are 76% of all the stars in the universe. 76% of the stars in the Milky Way and probably the entire universe are M-type. Those are the most common stars, while O-type on the other end of the spectrum are the big giant blue stars. Now, like I mentioned, this is only applicable for stars in the prime of their life. Once star stars start dying, 
Uh, you can't exactly match the type of the star to a particular size and mass and surface temperature because funny things are happening with a star. But if a star is just doing its thing, being a star, this is the connection between its spectral uh, type, O-type, B-type, G-type, and properties of that star. So if you hear, for example, G-type star, you'd know that is a sun-like star. It's so cool to me that Annie Jump Cannon like invented this and struck gold without even realizing that she was striking gold. Uh, but that's just astronomy for you. And because it works so well, that's why the system persists. That's why the letters make no sense. That's why they seem out of order. There's no rhyme or reason. It's just how they are. And it's because Annie Jump Cannon got it right. So I'll see you next week and I'll talk about what happens when stars do die and, and what those evolutions look like. Uh, in the meantime, please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to support me and all this science video stuff. Like, share, subscribe, do all the YouTube thingies, and I'll see you next time.